what I intend to do over the eight sessions that we have is to create uh, with you a survey of the tools that particularly Western society has used to think about itself and in doing that to think about architecture and to pursue and use architecture. This will involve us for the first two sessions <clears throat> in looking at the framework that we, that is most uh, Westerners and most countries that are in the process of modernization uh, have inherited. This framework is now more or less 300 years old. Beginning somewhere in Italy during the Renaissance in a very obscure way, taking on momentum and becoming more widespread during the so-called Enlightenment, becoming the political and social norm with the American Revolution of 1776 and the French Revolution of 1789, modeled on it, and then becoming the basis of what we call democratic cultures of rights, the basis of the modern state, the basis of modern science, the basis of modern politics, the basis of modern aesthetics. This whole animal is sometimes called the Enlightenment by people who don't like it very much. They want to get beyond the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is often used in the literature as a fairly bad thing. I hope to uh, show you that it still has fairly good resources. And good or bad, it's almost impossible to understand the present moment that we are in without sufficiently understanding the Enlightenment. What kind of project this was that your great, 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 great grandparents uh, embarked on with such high expectations and with enough success to have globalized the project and taken it around the earth and made it into a kind of norm from Singapore to Paraguay. Now to, <clears throat> to look at modernity, I will look at modernity and modernism and modernization for the first two sessions through the perspective of two bits of reading that you have. I take it you are all aficionado of the Dropbox by now. Hmm? You have downloaded the contents of the Dropbox and you're scratching your heads about what uh, I'm asking you to read, yes? Well, basically in the Dropbox is a library for the next 12 months. And I will show you how to get from the simpler parts to things which you may want to explore in depth. So we will have mapped the Dropbox by the time we are through with these sessions and added a few links into the Dropbox such that you can spend your time in a desperately meaningful way reading this stuff in the Dropbox and understanding everything there is to understand about the last 300 years. Does that sound reasonable? I don't expect you to read the entire Dropbox in, in four weeks, although it would be nice. Uh, <clears throat> you have two readings in the Dropbox. One that features at the very bottom is by Jürgen Habermas, um, a social philosopher, <clears throat> critic, uh, political gadfly, uh, born in 1929, so I guess your, uh, your grandparents' contemporary, still alive, very much alive, uh, sits in coffee shops like this until three in the morning, debating, um, who inherited the project and inherited, uh, as it were, the tradition of critical theory. Who of you have come across the term critical theory out there? Critical theory, social critique, the name which the Frankfurt School, a group of loosely Marxist uh, intellectuals uh, in the 1920s, Theodore Adorno, Walter Benjamin, uh, Max Horkheimer, um, Erich Fromm, and so on, Herbert Marcuse, got together and formed an institute for social forschung, for social research uh, in Germany, just as 
Hitler was coming to power. So a very interesting group of people who saw the rise of irrationality in German society and gave very important tools to reflect on it. Now, Jürgen Habermas is in a way the second generation of that uh, school and systematized the insights of his predecessors, the social critical and the aesthetic insights of, of people like Adorno and the philosophical insights of people like Adorno. Uh, Adorno, by the way, somebody who, who is regarded as perhaps the foremost German intellectual of the 20th century. And then, of course, every other camp who think he's the devil. But uh, Adorno and Benjamin and uh, almost all those founder members, many of whom were Jewish, were forced into exile by uh, the Nazi regime, had very disjointed intellectual lives. Walter Benjamin was pursued by the Gestapo trying to get over the Spanish border. He, he killed himself rather than be captured, where he would have gone to the death camps. And uh, they engaged with two major phenomenon, phenomena in uh, the 1920s, and that is the power of communism, which was just coming out of the Bolshevik Revolution, with Lenin in 1917, and which they felt extremely ambivalent about. They felt that the Russian Socialist Revolution uh, was giving out many warning signs that this attempt to re-engineer uh, Russian society was indeed uh, um, happening at an extremely high cost. Um, on the other hand, they witnessed the rise of fascism, which with uh, Hitler and Mussolini was an equally ambitious project of social re-engineering, an attempt to reconstruct German society after the very punitive conditions of the settlement after World War I. Germany was bankrupted by the nature of the settlement after World War I and in a way needed to uh, acquire not only economic stimulus again and create jobs like here, but to essentially regain its, its pride and its standing as one of the superpowers of Europe and indeed fascism was an attempt to organize and comprehensively re-engineer and modernize German society with that in mind. So the original members of the Frankfurt School, Jürgen Habermas's predecessors, saw an enormous pair of complementary and opposed experiments. The Nazis, you know, hated the communists and vice versa, but they both had a vision for reorganizing Central European society. Um, from the top down. Uh, and they were both on either side, as it were, of ordinary liberal democracy somewhere in the middle. So just that quick background of what this Frankfurt School is and where critical theory comes from, you can understand in those conditions that the pioneer critical theorists like Adorno and uh, Walter Benjamin <coughs> were in no position to sit and undertake systematic works. They were not living in a very restful time. They were living in the equivalent of South Africa in the 1980s. And it fell upon Jürgen Habermas to, as it were, strengthen the insights and pay homage to his uh, intellectual predecessors to recover or retrieve many of their insights from the context, the burning white context, if you like, of Nazism versus Bolshevism that uh, marked their uh, emergence into the world, and to systematize a critical theory that engaged with more modern positions, modern social sciences, modern economics, modern analytical philosophy, <coughs> philosophy of language, psychoanalysis, etc. Habermas wanted to either bring these things into support. Come in, ladies and gentlemen. So Habermas had a task of really updating, but at the same time preserving and forcefully restating in a systematic way the insights of his predecessors. His predecessors who really could find no simple solution to a society torn apart on the one hand by fascism, potentially torn apart on the other by uh, communism, a society going into what would come to be known uh, post-World War II as the Cold War, the period of the great nuclear standoffs between the East and the West. Uh, and Habermas's effort at systematizing um, 
created an extremely powerful resource, but quite difficult to get to grips with because he, he wrote so much and he continues to write so much and to engage critically across a very broad area of uh, concerns. <clears throat> it may interest you to know that he, he lives in an absolute Bauhaus type house, very sparse furniture, everything exposed, uh, books everywhere, neatly packed. Um, and that he is, I think, at heart, a very staunch modernist. Now, the particular piece which I've uh, uploaded for you cons concerns a view, his view, of modernism. Modernism being the term he uses for the aesthetic expressions or the aesthetic project of modernity of the last uh, 200, 300 years, and modernization, which is the term he and uh, sociologists like Max Weber use to describe the changes in society that happened during that period. The revolutionary changes from a sovereign kind of power with kings uh, to a parliamentary democracy with votes to a rule of law, rather than people being ruled equally by law, rather than some people ruling other people. Uh, <clears throat> the change to a concept of knowledge, um, very much led by science, and particularly the natural sciences in the 19th century, the human sciences, um, and to a particular conception of art, including architecture, based on the aesthetic and on trying to explore the aesthetic logic. So what Habermas means by modernization is really these two things happening in the history of art or in the history of architecture, a certain attitude, a certain new kind of subjectivity coming about and consolidating itself and becoming accessible through what we would call modern art, modern architecture the kind of art that begins in the middle of the 19th century with the Impressionists, with people like Manet, um, architecturally starts to take shape towards the end of the, of the 19th century uh, with people like Sullivan in New York, um, and then of course Frank Lloyd Wright uh, and everybody else that you know too well. Musically takes shape with people like Gustav Mahler in the 1890s, psychologically, theoretically take shape with people like Sigmund Freud in the 1890s. These are, in a sense, a modern approach to what? To experience, not to society. So the usefulness of Habermas' distinction between modernity and modernization is that modernity is best traced and understood through art, architecture, through its aesthetic, literary, musical, etc., and philosophical and lifestyle manifestations. But on the other hand, modernization does not necessarily take the same path or even a very uh, congruent path with aesthetic modernity or modernity considered as a kind of experience, a kind of new subjectivity. Modernization takes place through the emergence and the increasing power of the modern state, which is a massive system of administration. It manages society in accordance with your rights, and it manages your rights. If somebody does something horrible to you, the state will prosecute them on your behalf. So <clears throat> the state as a huge administration is a very distinctly modern organization, but it's part of the modernization of society. The relationships between people change when you have a state, the way you conduct your disputes <clears throat> cannot be like a cowboy town anymore. <clears throat> you <clears throat> sue people. You pay taxes. Taxes are spent on your behalf. Issues like the public good or the public benefit come to be formulated and debated. Representatives, who are the personnel or the managers uh, who work in the state, come to be elected, and so on and so forth. This is an institutional reality. It's an administrative reality. You have bureaucracies which make sure that life is administered, that rights are administered, that what the state delivers to you is delivered through the mechanism of a bureaucracy or, or an administration. And on the other hand, um, the force of modernization is economic. 
the kinds of e economy which we have uh, through modernization are not traditional economies based on agriculture. They are economies in which everything becomes more or less equivalent to anything else. And anything can be bought for money and anything can be transacted for money. They are economies centered on this unusual institution called the market. You'll hear people who like it very much call it the free market. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure how free it is. Maybe it's freer than, you know, a planned economy. Uh, but the market is simply a place where willing buyers and willing sellers come together and create a contract. Some people sell their labor and some people sell their time and some people sell their bodies and some people sell their brains and some people sell their services and some people sell other people's kidneys and organs. Um, and all equivalent to money, or you could swap a Lamborghini somewhere for an aircraft there and then flip that for a couple of lungs and kidneys in the Venezuelan market, or etc. Or you could transact in transactions, as happens with the stock market when you buy futures. So we have a, a kind of very unusual modern institution, the market, which is based on the universal equivalence of everything with every, everything. Everything has its price. There is nothing unique or singular. Everything can find its equivalence. When people say every man or woman has their price, the market is what will determine that price. And the market, as a modern institution, has had some marvelous uh, supporters. Somebody like Friedrich von Hayek and uh, somebody like you've seen in the recent US election, Ron Paul or um, Romney and Ryan, the, re the Republicans term themselves libertarian. They are saying that all society needs is free individuals and a market. Let's do away with the state. Let's do away with welfare and Obamacare. Let's do away with the state having any economic role. Let's do away with the Reserve Bank. Let's even privatize currency and do away with the dollar, as some poor fellow who got sentenced to 20 years uh, prison recently tried to do by introducing a privatized US currency. Um, <laughs> So libertarianism is a position which, which is opposed to strong government, which believes, but how can it simply oppose strong government like that? How can it oppose everything? Because it believes in the almost limitless powers of the free market. You might see my friend Leon Lowe on television sometimes talking on behalf of the Free Market Foundation. Um, and there is a very strong support usually neoconservative, and we'll see what this neoconservative means uh, from the Habermas piece when we get to it, uh, for libertarianism, which says all you need is, is a culture of rights that ensures the freedom of the individual, and the individual not only makes their way in society without help, but the individual makes everything society needs on the basis of market forces. It was a view strongly pushed by Ronald Reagan, by uh, Margaret Thatcher, who thought she was planting the seeds of a libertarian free market Zimbabwe in 1880, when she had 1980, could have been 1880 with her, in 1980, when, <clears throat> when in fact she, she wanted to create a liberated African state in Zimbabwe on free market uh, and libertarian principles. Um, I spot the mistake. So that is the other very influential institution, the modern market, and the modern state. And these are not institutions of modernity or modernism. They do not have an impact as such on how people experience or experience themselves or relate to themselves or experience beauty or experience their desires and their needs and their dreams and their relationships and their commonsensical world. They are institutions which have a direct impact <clears throat> upon society. In other words, the common resource that we try to create for one another by living together, they structure society. The state structures society according to the rule of law. The market structures the society according to the rule of value in transactions. <clears throat> and both of them provide very strong norms. Something has to have a certain profile to be a viable market activity. I'm sure you've heard your parents say to you, you You've got to be practical and give this a business sense and translate this into rands and cents. What they really mean by that is that probably your sensibility or your, your ambitions or your talents and skills, which have been formed until now in an aesthetic um, and subjective uh, modernist framework, which I'm sure you, you all 
are, are great consumers of or feeders on or believers in. And now they're saying to you, translate this into the norms of the market or translate it into the norms of the state, turn it into something which can be turned into a utility or something useful for society or useful for you to make a living. So that, that part of society called your mom and pop can retire and spend their savings rather than spend them on you. So there is that kind of distinction between two normative institutions, one economically normed and the other one normed around law and rights, uh, really means that they are powerful systems, extremely powerful systems, for setting up a certain kind of society. But it does not mean that they are necessarily congruent with or supportive of or not opposed to modernism, which is an attitude which is a certain view of time, which is a certain view of yourself, which is a certain freedom from practicality and willingness to explore sensation, form, material, etc. in a way that is often divorced from the norms which the state and uh, the market are such powerful custodians of. So Habermas's piece, which I, I hope you're all going to rush off and read this evening. It's only 14 pages. Some brilliant person has written little underlines or whatever in it. Um, <clears throat> but you can ignore that. Habermas's piece really tries to prov provide a framework in which to think both modernism and modernity in their entirety and to show that <clears throat> from the start there has been a kind of tension between these two forms, these two very powerful forms of Western experience. That the aesthetic modernity <clears throat> has been very difficult to absorb into a system, to administer it, to teach it, to formulate it in a textbook that it's given rise to its own institutions, but these institutions don't have the power to hang or exile or fine anybody. These institutions are the institutions of the avant-garde, the institutions of the art world, the institutions of the architectural profession, the institutions of musicians, jazz clubs, uh, writers and small publishers uh, that support literature, uh, poets, painters, and the critics who unpack what they do and somehow sustain the idea or make available the idea that there is a logic to be explored within these aesthetic realms. These little institutions, the avant-garde, the art world and so on, translate very badly into more formal institutions, state institutions such as the university. The university is a state institution. We are all civil servants insofar as we work for the university. You may not be aware of that. And <clears throat> the university has to deliver a service that is reproducing another generation of architects, accountants, actuaries, dentists, etc., etc., up to what? A certain norm that society expects, and that norm is believed to be beneficial or optimal for society. So they are administering a process of reproducing knowledge and, and doing it very well. But in institutions like uh, fine arts departments or even architecture schools to some degree, um, departments of literature which teach a lot of history of, of great books uh, and form your minds on great books but don't teach poetry writing or novel writing or story writing uh, hardly at all, um, there is a tension. And this is one of the tensions that Habermas talks about. You say, I came here in order to be creative in fine arts, and all they did was teach me about 300 other artists who are much greater than me and squash me into the dirt with their, their studio crits. You know, and I came here to make great buildings, etc., etc. and now I'm spending my time in a summer school trying to get some uh, this theory requirement and thesis requirement what of on board. And I would rather have a big piece of bump and a, you know, a pen like three times bigger than this and like whatever doing a thumbnail the size of a, a barn door. Um, and so there is that tension. I think you, you, you've been through the process of to experience that tension. But on the other hand, 
the institutions in which the aesthetic, the, modern, the modernist aesthetic, has unfolded that have given it a con continuity. The publishers of the magazines that brought out Corbusier's writings, that the photographers who specialized in airbrushing out the little scenes for Frank Lloyd Wright and putting those things before the public, the critics who, who, who created a framework for debating the merits and the demerits of such uh, modern works, all form an institution, but there are institutions which have fairly weak powers compared to the institutions of the market and the state. Often they don't do well in the market. Look at Van Gogh, he sold one painting in his lifetime. Um, often they are very bad at reproducing their content in apprenticing you to become a good Corbusier or a good critic. But these institutions, nevertheless, very powerful. Despite their obvious shortcomings, if you've got a chart which says Institutions 101, and you go to the SABS down the road here, or next door, wherever it is, and you check off how is this Bureau of Standards doing, it's an excellent institution. They can shut down your factory if you've got X amount of pollutant in the exhaust pipe. But the institutions of great critics, the publisher of, say, Harold Bloom today, who's a great literary critic in New York, or uh, of um, J.M. Coutier, and so on, have nothing like that power. They have no legislative power. They don't really have the kind of market power that Harry Potter has for a publisher. And yet, nevertheless, they are very powerful. And I think one of the interesting things about uh, Habermas's distinction is that he provides an explanation as to why, let's call it the art world, it, speaking inclusively of music, architecture, literature, poetry, dance, film, etc., why the institutions, the galleries, critics, uh, the artists, etc., have a very specific power, despite the institutional framework the way in which this thing affects society and, and creates society, being very lousy institutional framework or almost none at all. And yet critics have power, artists have power, they have the power to completely change something. Because what they are aiming at is not society. They are not aiming at creating a particular set of social relations or social resources, the way the CSIR or the SABS or the university or whatever uh, the Department of Trade and Industry is. Nor are they aimed at creating a certain kind of process based on transaction of value uh, because they don't mix ingredients. In fact, from an ingredient point of view, what they deal with is usually unique and usually not easily comparable to other things. And when it does get in the market, it sells for a ridiculous price. You know, $147 million for a Jackson Pollock. Uh, <clears throat> so, but nevertheless, this thing has power. And uh, Habermas's account in this paper, which you may wonder what paper it is, apart from being the one at the bottom of the drop box, it's called Modernity, Unfinished Project or incomplete in some translations, unfinished project. And it is a lecture or an address he gave on receiving the Theodore Adorno Prize from the city of Frankfurt, which is a great honor. Um, and in, in a way, he kind of aligns himself and also distances himself from Adorno, who, who was a very great philosopher of modernist aesthetics. Um, but spells out one of the major disconnects within our contemporary society, or the society we inherit as uh, Westerners, and that is the disconnect between the institutions which carry out modernization and the institutions in which, or the institutions which somehow uh, form an accretion around or form like uh, pearls in an, in an oyster, around the activity that we call artistic or aesthetic. Now, of course, um, if the aesthetic was just another very weak institution, 
and you could become a contributor to it by going to night school, paying your money, going through one, grade two, grade three, grade four, and then you get your certificate. You are now a member of this institution. The way you could get a certificate saying you are now a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants, go free, go forth and account. There's nothing which accredits you to go forth and become a significant member of the art world because two things are required. The one is basically a fairly self-sacrificial, at least according to the tradition of, 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 of modernity, which goes back to the middle of the 18th century, uh, 19th century to Baudelaire, to Manet, who Baudelaire wrote so much about, to Edgar Allan Poe, who's this crazy, unassimilable American uh, Gothic novelist, if you like, horror novelist. Um, this tradition, which goes through Van Gogh, goes through Corbusier, goes through Paul Klee, goes through Kandinsky, goes down today to, to uh, Damien Hirst, or whatever, um, <clears throat> requires something quite daring for which there is no recipe. There is no textbook. And that is a transformation of experience, a change in experience. If you come along, and you have exactly the same experience as our friend Trechikov. And you start producing Trechikovs in 2012. Apart from confusing the market, because I don't think anyone here can tell a fake Trechikov from a good <laughs> Trechikov. So you could clean up. But apart from that, you would quickly be accused of what? Not fraud, that's a sideline. In the aesthetic world, you would be accused of being inauthentic. Why? Because Trechikov's work, it's not really a great modernist, by the way, for those of you who don't get it, it's a gag, okay? But Trechikov's work, at very least, has an authenticity because Trechikov was responding to the world at that moment. He was choosing to be a kitschy artist, anti-modernist, laughing all the way to the bank, for 1950s and 1960s society for a Russian anti-communist in white South Africa. Now all of those funny things give him a certain uniqueness, a certain authenticity because he responded to those conditions and he embraced those conditions and he formulated a project for himself in those conditions. And that, that made it unique. Yes, it was not the project of Kandinsky, of Cezanne, of Jackson Pollock, of uh, Frank Stella, whatever. But indeed, it was a response. Now, if you come along with none of those other big factors, they've all dropped off the scene, and you start producing Trechikovs, people will accuse you, not of fraud, but of inauthenticity. You have failed to be real, because you are merely living someone else's history. You are merely repeating what for him was not a historical thing, but what for him was the immediate response to the present, the most sincere and genuine response. He became himself in that moment of history by doing that. But if you do it, okay, it's considered a complete copper. People will say you're an escapist. You're running away from your own times. That is precisely the kind of thing people said to Michael Graves uh, in the early 80s. You know, you, you are going back to a language that was worked out in, very, in a very different world in the, uh, the Boza Academy of Architecture, the pre-modernist, the pre-Bauhaus type of curriculum. Uh, and you are creating buildings that are basically the buildings of, of, of Schinkel. Um, but you're in 1880, in 1980, you're in Portland, you're not in 1880. I don't want to go on too much with authenticity, but there is a requirement in the aesthetic world that you embrace and to some extent remake your what? Experience. You remake your experience. And that's an important clue as to what the modern aesthetic is. It is a field in which you are supposed to show your competence by radically remaking your experience. It is a resource for both the consumer or the lover or the connoisseur of these works to remake their experience and to experience experience in a completely different mode to the habitual one, to the world that they are in. When you read a great novel, you are projected into the world of completely other people. 
into their lives, which are very unlike your lives. And so you've broadened the extent of your acquaintance with other people's lives and other possibilities of living. And you are able to better decide yourself how you should live, what is an important goal for you in life, which you must formulate and try and experiment with and adhere to. And all of the aesthetic in the modern uh, era has this requirement that somebody should have radically remade their experience or taken the opportunity to, to free up experience from what? Usually from these two big sets of norms. The aesthetic often gives us, and think about uh, Impressionism, or think about Van Gogh, or think about Gauguin, uh, think about really um, outstanding or exemplary modernists. They all, to some extent, react against the market, and they react against the state. They create a kind of bohemian world which wants to get by without money, without fame, without recognition, without glory, without security, without medical aid, without two cars uh, and an Afghan hound. And on the other hand, they are happy to take on an almost outlaw status in relation to the rule of law. Uh, the great poet Rambaud, the great modernist poet, you know, was on the run because he shot his best friend, Verlena, and then he ended up becoming an ivory trader and a gun runner in, in, in West Africa. Uh, so there was a certain mystique in the outlaw for this big modernist. Yes, sir. This uh, outlaw of avant garde and these exemplary figures that keep going, should you understand it or uh, is it constituted by, it sounds like quite a sort of elitist vocabulary of requirements and making the gray? It would be a very elitist vocabulary if it were not, say, also an existential, carried out existentially, it's something you have to do uh, to yourself. Um, if somebody were prescribing it to you, it would be a very elitist demand. It would be to say, to be like me, Jackson Pollock, you have to such and such and such. And, and we saw the disastrous effect of the second generation of abstract expressionist painters trying to be like Pollock. Instead of doing what Pollock did, which was trying to get away from something, figurative painting, and trying to become himself, even to the point of self-destruction. Uh, so, if I said to you, yes, you can enter this world on condition that you are like such and such, that's inauthentic. I'm saying you can enter this world to the extent to which you are like you and nothing else. I cannot make something in that world into a norm. Because then suddenly that world becomes something that it is always kicking against, and that is namely a tradition. A tradition is something which carries norms and provides examples of norms and of normative behavior or of normative styles or whatever, and rewards you and encourages you and makes your membership of the tradition a condition of having mastered a certain set of norms. Now, I'm arguing that. The avant-garde, as, as we have it up to, uh, say, 1920s in Europe, um, sets out to more or less deliberately reject norms. Where does it find them? It finds them weaving society together around norms in the great normative institutions of the market and the state, right? The rule of law and the rule of value. These are normative things. If you want to become a good business person, you understand the norms. Everything is a process that turns around a norm here. And if you want to become a good politician or a good citizen, you understand rights and you work within the framework of rights. So you work to extend rights or etc. Of you, an evil politician who likes power, you work to undermine rights. But either way, the medium you are working in is a norm. You're working with the norms of society. If you're a reformer, you want to propose different norms. If you're a conservative, you want to bolster up the existing norms. Free market society libertarians want to have the market as the overarching norm of society. Liberal Democrats uh, and welfare states want to have the rule of law, fairness, justice and rights as the overarching norm of society in all its transactions. <clears throat> but not to put too fine a point on this, what seems to characterize the avant-garde uh, in its early stages 
is that it wants to subvert norms. It wants to free up experience from the rule of norms. It wants to create perfectly useless experience. Hmm? Not good for business, not good for citizenship, unpatriotic, bohemian, drunk half the time, not crazy about work, misfit to society, i.e. misfit to norms. In, in fact, embracing the very counter image of norms that come up in modern society. Because as we have norms coming up strongly centered on the market and the state, which are the, the homes of their intelligibility, if you want to understand these norms, go into business or go into politics and you, you will find your life is structured by the way in which one can find elbow room in these norms and so on. But at the same time, institutions which try to normalize the abnormal spring up. No? Lunatic asylums, prisons, therapists, uh, modern churches, um, and these institutions provide a certain number of glamorous figures for the avant-garde. Look at Van Gogh, he was proudly lunatic. He was desperate to get into those asylums. He was very productive within those asylums. He had a certain romance with madness. Uh, the same is true of Nietzsche, a philosopher who steps into the position of madness and wants to comment or create a version of reality in society and history from the perspective of madness. Um, a great playwright, a theater person like Artaud. Artaud was a lifelong crazy. You know, if he was your cousin, you'd say, oh, we have to visit him in Stagfontein or Falkenberg or whatever this weekend, what a drag. But my goodness, he, he writes such interesting stuff. Surrealism, for example, wants to, to create a systematic subversion of reason. In other words, a subversion of norms. It wants to create perfectly useless objects. What could have less economic value than a fur-lined teacup? Uh, which we have a good example here. Um, <clears throat> and yet, paradoxically, that fur-lined teacup probably sells for millions at auction now in the same markets. So there is a flirtation with the irrational to be understood as the non-normative, as that which goes beyond even psychiatry, which goes beyond even everything in society that, that, that wants to prevent you, medicine, psychiatry, whatever, from destroying yourself, as with Jackson Pollock and his alcoholism and so on. Now, I don't want to create um, an impression of the uh, aesthetic or the avant-garde as a collection of lunatics, although to a very uh, large degree uh, it might be. But I want you to see in all of that a deliberate project. You could call it a... a uh, personal politics, if you like, of defying the norm and using whatever resources are available in society to defy the norm. As if the norm were something that <coughs> prevented experience becoming available to the individual that the individual could then grasp and authentically reconfigure. Van Gogh paints these beautiful pictures in an asylum. He's saying, here is an aesthetic logic and a reality that is far more real and compelling and attractive and fascinating than all this talk of mad and sane and this and that. I'm in the heart of the beast and I'm creating a statement that goes beyond the what, the experience, the consciousness, the sensibility of the time. The same is true of Gauguin. Gauguin starts this fascination with what in those days was particularly incorrectly known as the primitive. And he heads off for the various remote parts in the south of France. And he wants to find people who are perfectly happy just talking out loud to the Holy Virgin and asking Jesus a favor with this and that and so on. People whose world is almost a mythic world or a medieval religious world. And that is not strong enough medicine for him. He heads off to the Marquesas. He heads off to Tahiti. He heads off to, to, to everywhere where he thinks he's going to find a completely non-Western society. He's a kind of Jim Morrison of his day, without drugs, with a lot of alcohol and tobacco. I don't. And he, he wants to, in fact, to document another society and make that society infinitely more attractive 
than the society that he's in. He wants to critique his society in terms of an experience which lies beyond the boundaries of that society, which his own Paris uh, of that time. Remember, Gauguin was a stockbroker. He was a very successful stockbroker with a very bourgeois <coughs> Paris Hilton type of uh, Danish wife and several children. Uh, and he just split on all of them um, to, to go and paint on the islands. And if you look at Gauguin's paintings, it's not simply, ah, oh, I've dropped some acid and I'm looking at this amazing uh, scene in front of me and hey, wow. There is a very deliberate polemic going on in Gauguin's paintings because if you look at the ingredients of Gauguin's paintings, they are the ingredients of the Western Art Museum. There is some Egyptian element. There is some classical Greek element. There is citations from medieval art. There, there is a very deliberate attempt to almost say that the history of Western art culminates in Tahiti, in the scene on the beach. That, and the history of Western religion and mythology culminates and in fact carries on existing in this place where you have the Tahitian woman as the, the, the holy uh, mother, you know, the Virgin Mary and so on. And <clears throat> he brings an infinite number of mythological and historical and stylistic uh, ingredients to bear on creating in a completely Western vocabulary a completely other world, unassimilable to the Western experience. And he literally quests. He goes on a journey, puts himself through tremendous hardship. If you read his diaries, it's a real eye-opener. He's not there as a tourist. Uh, in order to transform himself, in order to metamorphose, not into Tahitian, but in order to metamorphose this moment in Western history, which he and Trechikov happened to op uh, operate in, to metamorphose it into something absolutely different and which can actually trump, like this game, for the moment, be on top of the Western history and the Western norms. Gauguin makes his paintings out of Western norms, but in order to fling the abnormality of those norms back in the face of the viewer. So Gauguin, one example. Now let's return to Habermas and the kind of framework uh, which he provides us with. On the one hand, <coughs> he gives us a very interesting tool, very important tool for understanding modernization. He says that uh, many people before us and the Renaissance have used the term modern to distinguish themselves from something else. So the term modern is, has a long history of contrast of us and them. He says in the fifth century, Christians were using the term modern to apply to themselves in, to distinguish themselves from the pagan world, the Roman and Greek world. Uh, Charlemagne, for instance, a great, uh, um, uh, he would say to me today, Germanic uh, emperor, revives Roman law and Roman administration and the notion of the king as an emperor from Rome. So he, he, he revives classic administration in the 12th century. And he does it in the name of the classical world, which he says is a modernization of the Christian medieval world. So he's pulling back the term modern. But in each case, modern applies to what we're doing now, whether Christian or classicizing, in contrast to what went before. So it is a polemical term, it is a warlike term to set up a boundary and distinguish yourself. The Renaissance, you have all studied, sets about a modernization program, but in the name of bringing back the classical world and saying that the Gothic world or the Christian world is in fact a degenerate form of the classical world and we want to bring the classical world back in all of its purity. If in Pompeii they had pictures on the wall, we'll have Michelangelo do frescoes. If they had sculptures in, in, in the wall, in the niches, in the apses, we will have uh, uh, Donatello putting things in the apses. If they had a geometrical architecture and a certain kind of tectonic, we are going to bring it back and rescue this from all the ghastly uh, um, distortions introduced by the Gothic. But they call themselves modern. But they are in fact separating themselves from what immediately went before. So this should, should suggest to you that if very different people could call themselves modern and get some mileage out of it, that the modern is not a particular kind of content 
You can't say what do they all have in common because in fact they're often from opposite sides of the fence. The modern is in fact a position taken on behalf of the present and saying there is something new or unique or special about now which allows us to reject or revise or to do without something that has gone before and that forms a tradition. So in a sense, our modern intuition that there is a thing called history and that history doesn't really have a normative power over us. What's the difference between history and tradition? Somebody who abides by a tradition doesn't see that tradition as going backwards in time, as receding, like some distant galaxy, you know, with red shift, it's going to soon disappear over the event horizon. Somebody who lives in tradition sees a tradition as now. But through the tradition, they see themselves linked in the same way to what somebody did 2,000, 3,000, whatever years ago. Think about Judaism as a tradition. Uh, doing the same things and feeling that they have exactly the same significance when you do them as when Moses did them and so on. Now, <clears throat> history, which is an offspring of this modern idea of the present being distinct or different, this intuition that time is somehow different for us as for them. Modernism develops history as a distinct form of inquiry into everything that it's not. And even if we have a history which is completely comprehensive, let's say we all drop everything we're doing and the whole planet sets about doing the history and archaeology of where we came from and we have this dream, like the 19th century German dream of knowing everything about everything historically, we still will have gained nothing because the way our relation to the present is structured means we cannot take something from history as a norm. That would be taking Tretchikov as your norm today. It's inauthentic. You are violating some quality in the present, which was not in history. But history is a history of past people's presence. But they had an authentic relation to their present. But for you to appropriate their present, it's your past. It cannot be authentic. You have to appropriate your present and you have to relate your present to a future. And in the modernist conception of, of the now, severed from tradition, unable to derive or, or a taboo against deriving normativity from history. If somebody derives normativity from history, you call them postmodern, neoclassical, whatever, or conservative. So there is an obligation to know history so that you can understand your present by contrast, but you're always in danger of being engulfed, overwhelmed, or awe-stricken by history, or paralyzed by history, by these great achievements. But your relation to history is antagonistic. You learn from it, but you have to bring it into your authentic presence. You cannot use it complete. You cannot slice it like biltong or salami or whatever and eat it here. You have to transfigure it into some resource in the present and in doing so change it. Hmm? So <clears throat> the present, the modernist present, the modernist sense of time does not prop itself up around tradition. There is no modern tradition. There is no sense of uh, the past informing the present. There is a sense of obligation to disconnect the present from the past. But what does give support to the present and makes the modern sensibility uh, something different to, to just being marooned in this present, you know, like a Robinson Crusoe in time, stuck on this island of the present, is that it has a particular view of the future. It sees the future as an unknown territory, but full of things that needs to be explored, that needs to be mapped, that needs to be consolidated. You need to bring in the new the new is something brought over and articulated from the future into the present. So the future almost takes the place of a resource for this modern sense of the present, a resource which history or tradition used to fulfill in, in past times but cannot fulfill anymore. Are you with me? I don't want you to become casualties like your colleague here. Um, <laughs> Um, so Habermas brings this, this, 
view out because in this article he is talking and switching almost paradoxically and contrastively between the artistic modernist project which is based in experience, weakly institutionalized, anti-normative, flirts with the irrational, finds authenticity by rejecting the past, even though it must know the past in case it inadvertently reproduces the past because it doesn't know the past, which is future-oriented, which in some respects could fall into mere fashionability or mere worship of novelty, but it has to pull itself up from that condition and, and provide a kind of dignity and a kind of ultimate reality or presence to the now. You could see the modernist as an experiential project, as human beings in the arts using their lives, their experience, in order to give the now some kind of shape and profile and presence and tangibility and intelligibility, the way in which we, we, we give traditions that kind of strong profile and that strong intelligibility or history, etc. It wants to, in some sense, probe and consolidate and create or co-create the present, the now. On the other hand, um, FF, as we have said, the modern, people who designate themselves as modern, are not talking about some quality now that they've got in their hand. It's not substantive. It is contrastive. They are saying the now is what it is because it's no longer like the past. This could be because the way things were done in the past has ceased to work, or our father's generation has created a disaster, etc. I mean, you yourselves are a perfect example of a potentially modernist uh, generation in this country because you could look back and you could say your grandfather and your fathers and mothers, let's not uh, exculpate any gender, uh, created perhaps as, um, many social problems. Um, and pursued certain social goals which were very unhandy and which created a tremendous uh, bad consequence and which you have now just come out of that stage. <clears throat> You've had 19 years, you're going to the 19th year now of democracy, etc. of these democratic normative institutions and the, the free market uh, accessible to everyone and not controlled by an elite and so on and so forth. So you, you yourselves could, could justifiably call yourselves South African moderns you could say, we cannot do what our grandfathers did. And even then, you must say, what is the authenticity of a modern-day Albert Herzog? But you, you yourselves could have something of that sense um, that Paris in the 1880s, World Expo, uh, railways, leisure, travel, um, going to the next village, public institutions, um, <clears throat> workers' uh, power and workers' strike, uh, powerful left, etc., being feeling part of a, a completely different generation that would have completely baffled your grandfather and would have depressed your father. And so, or the avant garde in Weimar, in Weimar, Germany, the Bauhaus, etc., uh, feeling that there is some qualitative difference between the present and the past, not because we can say what it is in the present but because we can say very much what it is in the past we are trying to get away from, that we cannot reproduce through our behavior, must not reproduce, or that has lost its value for us. It's like the past, uh, our tradition has devalued itself in our hands, and suddenly it's like foam, Shh, there's nothing. And so we have to start from something. And there is that constant sense, which is very much the sense of a need for a renaissance, for a rebirth of all institutions and experience and concepts and beliefs and whatever that, that, that haunts modernity. And I guess that everybody in the West who's called themselves modern, whether it's the 5th century Christians or uh, Vasari and his Renaissance uh, artists or, or Cezanne and Van Gogh or Picasso or the Dadaists or Jackson Pollock in New York in the 1940s and so on, has had a sense not of the present being particularly promising or good or better, but of the past being uniquely or suddenly very problematic and something that you cannot draw on and negotiate except at great cost. Um, that there is a decline and then we must change this decline. But I mean, what, what, what certainly makes um, communism and Nazism high modernist movements even though many people think they are conservative, 
They were not upholding past values. They were highly futuristic. The Nazi investment uh, in technology and in improved wonder weapon technology, in avant-garde technology, basically cost Hitler the war. The communist belief in a, in, a, in a future of abundance, we are doing all this and we're putting up with all this crap from Stalin in order to have an abundant future and a future of guaranteed, materially guaranteed equality is absolutely futuristic. And if you look at the artistic expressions given to the Russian Revolution, you look at the Russian constructivists and people like that who were so influential on abstract art and on the Bauhaus and on our architecture today, um, they had an incredibly futuristic vision. They imagined sublime projects for technologies which didn't yet exist and so on. And very much the same thing applies to Germany. They were trying to create a perfect society through modernization, but modernization on German terms on their own terms. They wanted to make modernization, not something forced on them, but something coming from within the people. And neither of these two things to be sneezed at, even though they are the two great disasters of the 20th century. But you can nevertheless sense that those projects happened because the Russians could not carry on under the Tsar, under that semi-feudal uh, agricultural, uh, very oppressive society. And Germany could not carry on in the situation of defeat. It had to reformulate itself as an advanced nation, which Hitler amply provided. So the experience, and we're talking aesthetically, the aesthetic is everything that is understandable through the senses, through consciousness as experience. It's thesis, the study of the senses, anesthesis, having your senses paralyzed, those of you who are anesthesiologists. Um, it has to do with what is, what is experienced and accessed to the senses and then communicates to the senses through a work of art, through another experience, through a sensory medium. These things have detached themselves from what is normative. If art or architecture becomes normative, you call it merely scholastic, right? You say it's academic because the poor academy tries to give you norms to emulate. But if you get stuck in those norms, you consider it a numbskull, justifiably, because you haven't risen to the game of making it your own and becoming what you are, going beyond it. So the, the aesthetic uh, might be learned and taught by little norms, but these norms are like a ladder that are supposed to be thrown away once you have climbed up the ladder. You climb up it and you throw it away, and at that point you are what? You, you are using your own experience and your consciousness in a free space, an autonomous space. Now, what is autonomous? If you are autonomous, what are you, what does it mean you're allowed to do? Determine my own being. And have answerability and responsibility to yourself. Yes. You have a duty to yourself and an obligation to yourself. And on the basis of that, you freely navigate. And if you want to kill yourself, I shouldn't stop you because in a way, unless I think you are of unsound mind, you have determined that killing yourself is the most authentic thing you can do. So in the, out of respect for your freedom, she has the gun. Well, actually, that's probably illegal. Jack Kevorkian would have an opinion on that. But um, when somebody wants medical euthanasia, they ask a doctor to end their life, whatever. One must assume that they're making an autonomous decision. Now, <clears throat> the aesthetic, what we call the arts, is an autonomous realm. But what makes it autonomous? It can freely provide norms and concepts for its own experiences out of the human imagination. And it has to safeguard that autonomy. Art becomes completely autonomous. When somebody like Gauguin can say, I want the sky to be pink, because that's how I feel it. Or somebody like Kandinsky can say, I don't want a sky at all. Why have a landscape dispense with the whole thing? Why not close my eyes and just convey that incredible entoptic pinkness or that private pictorial space? It doesn't have to correspond to the world, so it's autonomous 
from facts, autonomous from reality, as the sciences uh, see reality. And it is something which I am responsible for. I, as Kandinsky, have to work on that painting in order to make it communicate. I can't just say, drop out, go on a trip. Uh, I have to, in fact, say, I have created a world, but I'm now responsible for what? Putting that world, think of Kandinsky, in such a form, the first abstract artist, in such a form that it can gather consensus around it. You can see in it some value. You can agree with her that you love Kandinsky. You can agree or disagree with her. You say, I hate Kandinsky. I'd like to buy them all up and burn them. But the fact is it's communicated enough to you to create a consensus. Turning around Kandinsky, he's managed to communicate his autonomous conscious experience sensory experience to you in such a way that you and the Kandinsky haters can form a Facebook page and start hunting these things down and throwing acid on them in galleries and whatever. And on the other hand, you, the Kandinsky lovers, are so convinced that Kandinsky is a pivotal artist and a, a resource for the future and the present, uh, an illuminator of, of, of your lives, that you go around preemptively killing them to stop them carrying out these acts of artistic terror. You become you know, like uh, the CIA of art. <clears throat> so what has happened there is that what started as Kandinsky, Kandinsky had a, a great immersion, like the great South African artist Carl Nell. He had a great interest in entoptic phenomena. In other words, what the eyes see when you press on them or when you close them, they are not being given information from the outer world. But what is the obligation in this autonomy is to make an artistic language and to make a technique and to make works that communicate it or put it out there in such a way that con consensus can form. What is consensus? Kandis Kandinsky fans. What is consensus? Kandinsky haters. None of them believe they are hating fresh air. They all believe that they are hating some property around which we can strongly agree and strongly disagree. So the, the obligation of the artist is not just to have a vibey trip, to say, man, I'm so mellow. <laughs> I've got free of all the norms. And then the dog catcher comes and catches you with a big net and your parents put you in rehab and whatever. <laughs> it, it, it could be like that, okay? But you've got to come back from that then with something which is a free product of the human imagination, a free product of the individual judgment, qua individual as individual, but which, and here is the genius part, which is out there enough for you to form a consensus for anyone in the world, future and present, to form a consensus around. And when a Kandinsky or a Picasso or a Matisse comes on the scene, incredibly strong consensus is formed. There's a consensus that in some sense they have overturned history. But <clears throat> what is necessary is the technique the vision, the resources, the support system, the knowledge, etc., to divorce yourself from norms and then to propose something around which a new consensus can be established. And the artists whom we admire, whether it's Corbusier or Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, have all, in a way, managed to create a new consensus, not through their preaching or their magnetic personalities or lack thereof, but through their works. And once the work is out there, it has the power to disrupt whatever else is in that space and create that new consensus. So there are two elements in this. There is the, the demand in modern, the modern situation to free up experience from reality, from moral obligation, from society, from nature, etc., and to make that experience available for a kind of new configuration. It is autonomous. You are almost making your own consciousness and experience. And on the other hand, there is the demand to give proof to that through the work. And when we talk about great artists, we don't talk about their biography. Look at the terrible biography that Picasso is stuck with. Misogynist, womanizer, stingy, kept his own hair when he went to the barber. He had a huge basement full of hair. We always think of Picasso as bald, but now you know why. He had this view that anything from inside the body 
to outside could somehow be used to bewitch him so he would keep his toenails. Somewhere in the Picasso archives there is a nice bag of toenails, hair, whatever. So from a biographical point of view, you have an extraordinarily troubled um, individual. But the biography is far less important than the works in our modern way of viewing things. Now, you may wonder why, um, what this issue of autonomy is like, or whether it is just art as an institution that, that, that is driven or propelled by this autonomy and its fumes and its promise. And this autonomy is a kind of freedom to explore the present. It's as if the present somehow comes into and seeps through this autonomy and is reflected there in a privileged way. And that is how art has been seen in the West, at least from 1850, the time of Manet, uh, up until, say, the 1950s, when it takes a very ironic, inward-looking turn with, say, somebody like Jasper Johns. So, uh, at least for that period of, of let's say, uh, heroic uh, modernism in art, um, the view was autonomy, originality, authenticity, innovation, the new works which could somehow come unexpectedly into the world, chup, and are so extraordinary that they can create a new consensus and stir up like magnetic filings the way the art world thinks. And of course there are critics who are the midwives to these works, who try and find the concepts to communicate what's going on, what's important about this historically, aesthetically, emotionally, uh, ideologically, politically, whatever, to the whole of society, to, to people who, who want to become connoisseurs of these works and use them in their everyday experience in life to take something of their power. So what I've described here is almost like a kind of witchcraft, animistic, rather strange institution. Um, but I can assure you that if one looks at, say, the history of painting, and, I, and painting is a good example here because it's the most divorced from any material use. Sculptures still go into monuments. Architecture, we know, engages with all kinds of, of practical application. Um, but music, maybe, and painting, particularly abstract painting, when painting is abstract, it no longer ha even has the function of memory or memorialization. That goes to photography, to know what grandpa looked like or Napoleon looked like or who was doing what in that battle, um, or even a Paris street. When painting becomes abstract, it loses its last tie to practical function of, of memory uh, or chronicling, and it becomes free to explore this absolutely autonomous realm of experience. But this realm is crisscrossed by very strange powers. Now, <clears throat> who is to say that this autonomous realm, the aesthetic realm, one of Habermas's three autonomous realms, is the aesthetic realm for him. And he discusses this and threads that through the article as modernism. But there's another mysterious one here, and there's another mysterious one there. And they are equally autonomous. Part of modernity, that condition in which we think of ourselves, we think of our society, we think of everything, we think of nature and the world through the framework of modernity, comes from these two institutions. And they are all come about sometime in the 17th and 18th century when, of all things, reason, reason, that instrument which is supposed to allow humans, since Plato and Aristotle, to inquire into what we are, how things are, what the universe is, what God was thinking when he made us this way, etc. Reason, that, that sort of special soap that can make various issues lather up, you know, and bubble up into answers, into an inquiry. Reason was a theological and very unified thing. Everything that was in human experience could be reasoned about. If you read the classic philosophers, if you read uh, Aristotle and Plato, you see they have an insane range of concerns. <coughs> but in each concern they are reasoning about it. They are trying to give it some kind of form or directed inquiry. And this reason embraces everything. If you think of one of the great reasoners, if you think of in the Jewish tradition Maimonides, or if you think in the Christian tradition Thomas Aquinas, they have a system of reasoning 
which gives everything in its place and a place for everything and an explanation for everything and almost like an attempt to adopt the viewpoint of the mind of God and say, well, what was intended? What's the meaning of this? Why are things the way they are? Here's the answer. So you have this very unified system of reason. Now, one of the things which characterizes modernity, the modern world and its institutions, is the splitting of that big unified reason into three independent autonomous realms that have very little to do with each other, that you have to build bridges between. <coughs> but what's important is that they're each autonomous, they're each free to pursue their own objectives in their own way. Nothing outside of them can prescribe to them, not theology, not tradition, not society, not human taste, not anything, can prescribe to them how they ought to be. And the one realm is our knowledge of nature, the natural, the sciences. What we call the sciences, and everybody knows from a chewing gum wrapper, that the Western sciences formulated strongly by Galileo, who has an integral science of nature and can explain forces and moving bodies and dynamics and systems, the kind of thing you learn when you calculate a truss, uh, even today. Um, <coughs> The natural sciences are their own distinct mode of inquiry. They are autonomous. Only natural scientists can decide on which natural science concept to change. Only natural scientists, duly accredited, natural scientists can decide which way scientific research is going to go. Only natural scientists can decide whether a, what is a valid problem. Only natural scientists can decide whether a scientific problem has been solved or resolved. So it is autonomous in the sense that scientific consensus completely determines what happens in this area. But what society gets from it is reliable knowledge, the ability to build a 747 that won't fall out the sky or build uh, dams that won't flood uh, whatever, um, to do whatever we do with nature as a resource. And increasingly to turn these sciences upon ourselves uh, neurosciences, linguistics, whatever, and investigate ourselves as an intelligible object. So the sciences are an autonomous realm. The last autonomous realm is in fact politics, morality, how we should act. Here human action is no longer a matter of those actions which will save your soul or lead to your salvation or which are kind or just or charitable, which the great religious traditions all had a doctrine of human action based on an understanding of how you were created, what kind of entity you are and you should act appropriately with your nature, etc., or how you were intended to act or your destiny. Here actions come into a perfectly speculative relationship with their norms. We can sit and debate the content of justice, the content of fairness, the content of the good life, etc. We can debate these things and we can change these goals. In other words, we subject human actions to norms and we debate about these norms in politics. So we have an autonomous realm of action. In other words, action takes its own norms and its own discourse on those norms, its own reasoning, and creates a special kind of reasoning, politics and moral reasoning, discussions of duty and obligation and justice and culpability and so on, such that you see constantly on lawyer movies uh, on TV. And here, and of course the aims, how do we collectively determine the aims of society? Who do we vote for? What do we accept? What do we rebel against, etc.? That is this consensus formed around what we consider to be rational, ap appropriate, effective action. So we take action into an autonomous realm and we st structure and redesign action in our politics, our morality, our differences of lifestyle, uh, attitude, value, etc. And here, we take nature into an autonomous realm and we create almost a second nature in knowledge in the laboratory and we, we say that we are going to base our knowledge, what we think we know, what we, what we reliably know upon this activity, the consensus of scientists and their internal concepts, the consensus of politicians uh, and moral philosophers and critics, uh, political critics. Here, here's Adam Habib, here's Jacob Zuma, here's Julius, here's somebody denouncing the whole setup as absolutely terrible, Plato, or the Ayatollah Khomeini, etc. 
They're all part of a circle of discussion here. Art, we've seen, is an attempt to give the same autonomy to put its own uh, uh, resources and its own freely deter choose its own destiny to experience. And here, we are trying to give nature a particular role as the touchstone, as that thing outside of us that we want our knowledge to conform to when we believe uh, we are talking the truth or knowing the truth. But the interesting thing here is that here you have something outside politics to judge this against. You can say so-and-so was an atheist and he went to rack and ruin. Here he is going to rack and ruin. You know, whatever with his bottle of absinthe and whatever staggering around in the gutter because of his aberrant beliefs, right? So you can say, ah, here is X belief and there is something outside of that. It's consequence. Or we can say the disaster of Hitler, the disaster of Stalin, or the disaster of Helen Ziller, or the disaster of Jacob Zuma, or whatever. Or we could say the virtue of Stalin, Hitler, Helen Ziller, etc., etc., by pointing to some historical fact, to something which happened. So there is something outside of politics which serves as its norm. The general prosperity, the general happiness, uh, ending a war, getting into a war, it's, it still has something which it is about. Hmm? And science is very much about something. It is about the order of the physical universe. And when our scientific concepts are good, they're very much about that order. They're reflected, they're captured, and therefore we, we're in the habit of calling them true. But this is a unique one, because there's nothing outside it which it's about. It's not about its history. It's not about its traditions. If you follow history, you're a conservative. If you follow the traditions here, you're inauthentic. There is no great future or somewhere which it is capturing. When Kandinsky shuts his eyes, he sometimes thinks he's talking about another spiritual realm. He wants to be like the sciences, There's something outside here that he's describing or mapping or whatever. But it really doesn't work out that way. That is just to encourage him. It's like pinching yourself when you're falling asleep during exams, you know, the night before. It's just to pinch himself, saying, I'm, I'm going into this unknown territory, but there are landmarks there. Kandinsky's uh, mysticism or theosophy and also with Mondrian and so on. So, but in fact, there are no landmarks here because ultimately this thing must make a case for itself, demonstrate autonomy, demonstrate authenticity. So unusually, these are two autonomous realms, but these autonomous realms have benchmarks in nature and in human history, in society. We can say you're doing well because the dollar has gone up or you're doing well because the stock market has gone up, or whatever. And here, you're doing well because you could make an atom bomb, or you can make good antibiotics, or whatever. And the planes don't fall out of the sky. The trusses don't invert. But here, the norm is radically within itself. It is seizing experience and providing experience with its own internal norm. And that norm can hardly be stated. It can only be challenged on the inside. And that is why this aesthetic realm has been so fertile in defining experience, modern experience. These things define nature. These things define policy and norms of society. But this has defined experience. And in a way, this restructures experience. And these things enter into or filter into experience, but they can never take it over. These are the systematic frameworks in which we conduct our lives, and we can expect systematic indications of how we should conduct our lives. But this thing is almost the opposite. And so that is what Habermas establishes in his first five pages. It's going to be easier to sit here and read that. Okay, so take a break. Before the smug break, <clears throat> we saw that for Habermas, the modern is characterized <clears throat> by three autonomous spheres of activity. This one, the natural scientific, is clearly something which deals with facts. The science either corresponds to the way things are or it doesn't. So this relates to facts outside of itself. It doesn't make up the way nature is according to the whims of scientists and their consensus. But this one, the political and the moral, what we consider to be good action, just action, the, the ends of our uh, practical activity, 
the kind of society we want seen, the society seen as a continuity of actions or integration of all of our actions. This one too has a relationship to fact, not facts outside of it. It's not modeling itself on some perfect political beyond the way Plato's Republic imagined there was a perfect political beyond that societies uh, on earth could copy. Um, but it does something more interesting. It produces facts. The historians are the people who gather together and package and refine the facts produced by politics, by social history, by the changes of society. So any historical narrative, in fact, encapsulates the facts and the explanations that this thing generates or spins like a silkworm. However, this one seems to run in the opposite direction of facts and norms. It's very hard to encapsulate. Yes, there's a lot of art history, but art history in relation to modernity is the history of what you can no longer do, but what your predecessors did in such a great way, it might still put a shadow over you, but you cannot imitate it, because if you imitate it, you're thrown out the game. You are merely a derivative artist. You lack engagement, authentic engagement, with the potentials of the present. So this is, in a way, a fairly anti-factual thing. There is no history outside of it, there is no model of what art should be outside of it that it can emulate. There is no benchmark, as uh, modern uh, management theorists would use this term, there is no benchmark for this. And in fact, to introduce a benchmark into it or a norm into it would be catastrophic. Whereas science without benchmarks would be a science in which no one can agree on the facts. It would be chaotic. And a politics without benchmarks would be a politics that has got no rational structure that provides no model, that provides no more, no intelligibility. It would be a politics of sheer opportunism. Now, what is so interesting uh, in Habermas' account, the really interesting, sexy part uh, starts to come out after he establishes this, is that these are autonomous realms because to play this game, you have to master the terms of science. You have to have a specific apprenticeship as a specialist. To be a politician or a jurist or a lawyer and deal with this issue of actions and rights and norms, you have to go through a long apprenticeship and enter into and master a very technical language that is very divorced from the experience of the average person in the street. They don't deal with the issues that, that intrigue the Court of Appeal in Bloemfontein where the anti-tolling lobby wants to go now and challenge the illegality of a certain judgment brought upon them by the pro-tolling lobby, which is where the tolling issue stands. Exactly what that technicality is, is hard for you to understand, but you accept it because you accept it's being done rationally in your name. You know which side you're on. You've either got shares in the tolling thing or you don't want to pay it. But you know that the technicians, if you like, are going to do it. The same is true of the fiscal cliff. This community is battling with the fiscal cliff, but how many of you can tell me in three sentences what the fiscal cliff is? But you know it's going to have a huge impact on the popularity of President Obama and on American policy as it plays out. And you know that the resolution came one day after New Year when the taxes kicked in automatically. So they are subject even to their own bulldozer before the cliff and so on and so forth. But the actual unpacking of the issue, as the economists in here or the jurists in here, uh, might do it, is beyond most of us. <clears throat> now in here, the issue of a specialization is much more problematic. We are quite content to have our scientists and to have our, our chief justices specialize in the law or specialize in scientific theory and experiment. We are happy to read about quarks in U Magazine uh, or Stephen Hawking's books whatever it is on bubblegum wrappers, or wherever these things are filtered to. But we don't necessarily feel the need to go up there, call these scientists out and validate what they're doing in our name. But what they're doing in our name is producing our knowledge. But we don't necessarily pull economists out and say, we need to be sure that we understand what you're doing. We relate to it through policies. A political party has a certain economic policy, a certain legislative policy, Another one has another one. This one is an elephant. This one is a donkey. 
we sit and weigh it up, we say Obama has such a sexy smile, or Mitt Romney's my kind of guy, whatever it is, and suddenly they're back in here. But in fact, they're doing everything, they're making history in our name. But here, how good is it, or bad is it, for artists to be specialists in that sense? What is the point of art which uses the medium of experience to form itself in and uses the medium of experience to communicate itself to all of us and to become a material for debate and for the building of consensus and for further adventures in this subjective realm. How good is it for art to be a matter of specialists? How happy would we be if our architecture, if our music, if our art was purely a matter of high-level theoretical debate between critics and artists? And the only people who were comfortable or felt suitably accredited to look at art and to deal with art were people who were esoteric artists themselves, the way nuclear physicists are esoteric knowledge people when they deal with subatomic particles. They might be total Homer Simpsons when they deal with their wife and kids. But in this realm, they're specialists. Now, this realm we've seen has got certain borders, anti-normativity, autonomy. So this is also an autonomous, isolated realm. What happens here and what happens there doesn't impact on that. This cannot impose a political logic on that. This cannot impose a polit uh, aesthetic logic on that. When you impose an aesthetic logic on politics, you get Nazism, you get the spectacle in aestheticized politics. And when you impose uh, communist political logic on art, you get boring socialist realism. You know? But so when these two things impose logics or share concepts or experiences, we regard that as pathological. We don't want a scientific politics. Would it help very much if in the presidential debate Mitt Romney and uh, uh, President Obama were wired up to encephalograms and the top neuroscientists from Harvard were sitting there with super lie detectors watching the different parts of their brains act up and every now and again instead of turning to the chairperson they snort some huge isotope of oxygen so that we can see what the brain's doing and they're saying I'm bearing my brain to the nation. So you can see what an honest candidate I am, okay? Would that be an advance? Would it be an advance to impose the matter of science and the matter of politics? No, of course not. Because what we want to know is how that person can debate. Debate is a rhetorical practice with its own rules. Being presidential has nothing to do with what your brain cells are doing. It has to do with character, it has to do with experience, it has to do with a million other things. Too complex to integrate in, in, in a little brain pictures. So it's not about lie detectors making better politicians. It's about how well politicians can spin the political world, how well they can create that universe and manage that universe, which we call our history and our common interest that we've given to them to manage. At the same time, what happens if we try to politicize science and stay, instead of following the objectives of pure research where the one puzzle solved creates another problem to be solved and so on, Instead of that kind of succession, we want to determine signs which leads to uh, better nuclear weapons or to uh, better agriculture or to genetically modified humans into more docile people or a perfect master race uh, of eugenics, etc. We regard that as a violation of science because we feel that the logic of scientific inquiry, which is autonomous, will be torn apart, made impure, fragmented, weakened by having political goals imposed on it. Autonomy means you generate your goals and you generate your solutions in here. You cannot transplant from there to there. You can perhaps reason across these realms and make certain limited transplants, but there can be nothing like that. You can't say we will turbocharge art by politicizing it, or we will turbocharge science by aestheticizing it, or we will turbocharge art by scientifying it. In architecture, there are endless attempts to say art is wide open, waiting for some kind of scientific principle to come and, and, and you know, put its house in order. From Buckminster Fuller to uh, Corbusier's standardization to the Bauhaus with its idea of industrial production and so on and so forth. Um, these are all very interesting and always unsuccessful, although fascinating attempts to push the logic in it to that, in it to that, in it to that 
across uh, borders and it always dies out because we seem to have a very fundamental commitment in terms of what we consider rational and what we consider legitimate, what we will accept from politicians, from scientists and expert knowers and from artists. We have a very clear intuition of what counts as a legitimate result, as a legitimate presence of these three uh, practices in society. So having established that autonomy also means non-exchange and superimposability between these realms, we can also see that this realm spins facts through an internal history, if you like, like this. What are those French knitting things where it goes down the middle, which I could never do as a kid. Only the girls could do them. I completely like that thing. You take a crochet hook, you go there, you go there, you go there, and you have this big kind of sausage made of ugly wool that your mother doesn't want coming out the middle. That is politics, the public realm. It generates history, historical narrative, and that's how it is intelligible. This is where its facts are generated, and we weigh it up by its facts. Unfortunately, always in retrospect, and never, you know, there's no big super norm here which we can add it up to. Uh, and science, we would regard science that has been interfered with by creationists, interfered with by politicians, interfered with by, by grant financiers, interfered with by very ideological scientists. We'd regard it as somehow lacking legitimacy. It might pro produce results, but it lacks legitimacy. We have a difficult time accepting that Nazi medicine, which uh, carried out so many political and ideological atrocities, could in fact have got certain things very right, such as the relationship between smoking and lung cancer, which was demonstrated by the Nazi doctors, but in fact suppressed for a long time because of where it came from. So in other words, even facts, we're prepared to let some facts go by the board, some knowledge uh, fall, fall off the wagon, because we don't accept the legitimacy of its source. And why is the source not legitimate? Because it is not sufficiently autonomous. So this issue of autonomy is a major, major condition. When we say our societies, uh, um, uh, do you say, uh, set great store by freedom. For them, freedom is a paramount value. For Americans, freedom is a paramount value, etc. cetera. Uh, this freedom is really the, the, the practical expression of the autonomy that we expect from our three major institutions. And we also expect their independence. When artists talk like scientists or, or want the status of a science or want the status of politics and history, we tend to think that they are using a complex metaphor. And we say if it's inspiring and interesting to them to further rearrange this subjective space and produce further works to be put uh, in candidacy for our appreciation or our, our consensus, then we say that's fine, it's been a fruitful metaphor. But if they get so hooked up in science, or they get so hooked up in politics that they never come out, we say they are ex-artists. They are now politicians. They are now amateur scientists. They are lost to this process. So the autonomy here is very important, even though there is not a single fact. You may argue that this long tail of history, and we have endless histories around architecture and whatever, but this history is a narrative of what can no longer be done. If you just transplant something in here from here, you have lost legitimacy because you've lost authenticity. You are painting like Renoir today. If you paint like Renoir today, it can only be camp. Someone will say you're being campy. So it cannot be paint like Renoir because he had no idea of what camp would be. It was not an available critical concept to become part of Renoir's intention. But for you to paint like Renoir today is campy. For you to make things like Andy Warhol today is retro. So this has a very interesting and complex set of requirements. But for Habermas, it is interesting, even though it's very problematic, as we've seen uh, this afternoon, it is a very problematic thing to characterize. It nevertheless has its own legitimacy and logic and rules, very inward, very internal to it, no external benchmark. But because it, it, it takes place in the format of experience, it is important because everybody has experience. It's the most democratic thing. We all have experience. We all have senses. We all have the same senses. We can all change our senses. We can change our taste. We can change the way we see things, etc. 
we are all endowed with an equal sensory realm, just as I believe we're all endowed with an absolutely equal intelligence, but maybe not an equal will to apply it. So here, we have a set of subject matters very far from experience. Very few of you could experience an x-ray the way an orthopedic surgeon does or extract that information from it. Very few, few of you could find your way around the inside of a brain the way a neurosurgeon does. Very few of you could identify in those bubble chamber pictures which kind of particle is doing what. So it is something very far removed from experience that needs to be primed by a fairly esoteric theory in order to, to be experienceable at all by a handful of specialists caught up in a very tight, a very scholastic consensus. And here, which is a, a public thing, politics is a more public thing, and our debate around values and what we do and what our kind of society should be is a very public process. But nevertheless, it too involves participation. It makes no sense if you don't participate in this thing. If you're not either doing it or you have some active stake in it, it may as well be the Canadian elections. It may as well be the Canadian Parliament for all we care. Something fantastically polite and no doubt uh, boring. So here, however, we cannot avoid art stumbling into our experience. We cannot avoid almost polluting our experience with art. You see a Van Gogh and then you look at cypress trees and suddenly they flicker and flash like that or whatever. This thing permeates experience and it, it has a continuity with experience down here. But what is down here? And this is the interesting part of Habermas's uh, argument, the very political and challenging part of his article. What is down here is all of us. Insofar as we are not the handful of specialist scientists and inquirers, insofar as we're not the handful of elected, mandated politicians holding public office, and insofar as we are not practicing artists, most of us in this room are here. But if we're here, what have we got? We've got our common sense, our ability to make sense of the world, to communicate with one another, to have a little bit of an argument, to use our ordinary language without any concept like quark or constitutionality or uh, deconstruction um, in order to get along with one another, even hate each other or love each other, or agree with one another, or marry each other, or divorce each other. So we can transact perfectly well without the contents of these realms. We have a fairly well-structured thing, which is our life and our experience, as we are able to make sense of it, pre-theoretically, non-theoretically. You don't have to turn up the heat and put your husband in a lie detector. To know if he's lying, it's like that joke about the poor praying mantis comes home without his head and his wife says, yes, you've been cheating. You don't need, <laughs> you don't need some kind of, of, of incredible factual yardstick, what people call a fact, and you don't need 50 years and then do a, a, a review of your relationship for 50 years with the help of, of, of the world's greatest historians in order to read the narrative and find out whether you've got a good or bad friendship, good or bad relationship, or whether in fact you're a good or bad person, whether more, more people hate you than like you, whether you're a good friend, you're a good daughter, you're a good father, a good grandfather, whatever. So this seems to have the ability to get on quite well without that. And in the perspective of this, these, seems, these things seem like enormous specializations. And indeed, there are specializations. A handful of people are professionally occupied and become authority in these areas. So why do we keep them around? Because in some sense, for Habermas, they constitute the modern project. They concentrate in their different ways an important progress or an important advance in our experience, in our knowledge of the world, and in the way we can conduct our affairs in our public institutions. 
and therefore they're almost like experimental sites which run ahead of experience here that has a certain inertia experience here is held together not by theory not by these kinds of of worlds art world science consensus political worlds public realms it is held together by tradition you learn to speak from your parents speaking you learn how to behave towards others from what you see in your family you learn things from one another this is very weakly institutionalized it is a tradition and that tradition is not critically evaluated every two minutes you know you get an examination the first thing it says critically analyze and discuss to get exams like that still nowadays the non postmodern exam but this, this area is seldom critically evaluated and discussed. What we do here in order to ensure the cooperation or the love or whatever of our friends and the, the maximum irritation to our enemies is something that we do in a very intuitive, very commonsensical way. Our ordinary language and our ordinary common sense notions of, of the world and society and experience are sufficient to navigate around this thing and to keep this tradition alive. And no doubt the way you have common sense is no different to the way in which Fred Flintstone's kids had common sense whenever. So there is this huge traditional mass over here, uh, a flywheel, opposed to these rather specialist and esoteric institutions. And the question is, why do we have them around? If these things don't fit into our experience, without ourselves having to go through the, the loop of specialization, of remodeling and revamping and revising our experience in order to make it somehow coextensive with these things. Then in fact, why do we have them? We have them as laboratories of human benefit, says Habermas. We maintain them the way we maintain R&D. And if something good comes out of it, we accept it and make it part of this. We make it a suburb of this. But we don't take this to that and translate it into esoteric terms, or specialist terms. We take some result of this into here. We take some result of that into there. In other words, we constantly use the results of these three autonomous realms of reason, these three secularized, post-theological, post-unified, post-mythic realms of human reasoning. We unify them only here. But when we unify them here, we've translated them into the terms of this realm. Because if we haven't translated them into these terms, we have no way of handling them, no way of doing anything with them. They just got past us. So we could say that these things have got a job to do, proving themselves, translating themselves, making themselves available, without disrupting the unity of this little tradition that nobody calls a tradition of our common sense, of our everyday experience. However, because the West or modernity tends to think of itself in the very prestigious way of the massive advances of science, the power of science over nature, the massive progressiveness and the innovation of our arts, the originality of our arts, and because it tends to think of itself in, in, in terms of politics as a constant progress towards a, a bigger culture of rights, towards a bigger happiness of every child born on this earth, all children have a better future, better opportunity, etc. We've got very ambitious, very extraordinary programs here. But these programs hardly translate into common sense. But we have a tendency to want to turn this commonsensical world inside out so that it starts behaving like a science, so that it starts behaving like the arts, so that it starts behaving like politics. And of course, in doing that, we tear it into three parts because there is no connection between these three. So essentially, when this relates very strongly to that and is magnetized upward, it creates a very strong analogy and almost a cult of science within common sense. Science then becomes a kind of implicit norm for common sense with fairly disastrous consequences because common sense, the world in which we live and experience, is not made up of atoms and particles or whatever. It doesn't help me 
to say that this is 99% void. Because if I try and put my fist through it, I'm going to break all my bones. On this macro level of common sense, it's not a void. And if something came through it like a void, you'd all be pretty horrified. So to try and create a congruity between common sense and the world of science, the world in which we think and the world in which we live, in that case, is, is distortive of that. You cannot pull this up into this. But one can expect this to translate into this without disruption. So that we can, within the purposes of our common sense lives and identity, make use of the results of science or steer science or steer these systems. But if we don't do that translation and we simply move them down, they encroach. And the biggest way in which they encroach is to tear this into three analogous spheres of preoccupation. Pseudo-scientific, pseudo-artistic, and pseudo-political. So the challenge which Habermas lays out is this. He says that the condemnation of modernity that we saw recently in postmodernism and the condemnation of modernity that we saw recently, or not so recently, maybe in your grandfather's generation, that we saw in the conservatives who were opposed to modernism, the people who still wanted the royalty, the French king, uh, etc., um, contemporary society, society for, for example, which wants an absolute monarch, um, people who still want the death penalty, etc., uh, people who say it was better under Hendrik Verwoerd or Joseph Stalin or whatever. That conservative thing which says before all this happened and before these dynamics took off according to their own rules and took off in their own directions, like an uh, out-of-control uh, train, that things were much better. We should go back to a theocratic society. We should go back to a unified substantive reason rather than to the critical application of reason to politics, to aesthetics and to nature. So that is old-fashioned conservatism, and Habermas characterizes old-fashioned conservatism, saying that old-fashioned conservatism could perhaps, under a theocratic creationist or the American right, etc., as we've seen, it could unify these three realms and use them as tools. But basically, the medium of society, of experience, would be here. But you can see what the conservatives, the fallacy of their position, is that they, in effect, saying there is a form of reason up here which will quickly become its own philosophical speciality. And so we are putting a very strong armature and backbone into this realm of ordinary experience. We want it to be theologically permeated. We want it to be based on belief. We want it to be based on unquestionable value, etc. So they too are as bad as these guys. They're replacing one rigid theorization with three, simply because that unifies these three under a bigger logic. Um, it then becomes a substantive norm and, and worse, an unchallengeable norm to the Lebenswelt, as, as uh, Habermas calls it, the life world, the world in which we have our common sense and carry out most of our existence without specialization, without these strong thematizations. On the other hand, there are what Habermas interestingly calls neoconservatives. And here he attacks an interesting bunch of people because he calls Derrida, Foucault, Nietzsche, Georges Bataille, people who you would really consider to be cool crazies. He calls them extreme conservatives, modern conservatives, because he's saying that they are rejecting this kind of fragmentation and they want to implement these things directly in experience in the form of an experiential kind of ex extreme. In other words, you want to be like Van Gogh. You want to be like Nietzsche. You want to take the content of these things and live it directly. Now, <clears throat> it's a very difficult thing to do. And when one does that thing, I'm not sure whether it's a very rewarding basis for a human society, for the continuity of human affairs. There was a great uh, logician called Beth uh, who taught Gödel and many other people. And he was such a brilliant logician, and this happens to many mathematicians uh, that I know, that he started to embody logic in his behavior, you know, and Gödel also started to embody logic in his behavior. He married a Las Vegas showgirl, but that didn't make him happy. 
And he basically believed that people were trying to poison him and he became anorexic and died. And so when one of the greatest mathematical minds went out because he was looking for absolute consistency in his life and he couldn't find the proof and so he just took the precautionary measure and he thought if I don't eat they can't poison me, very logical, so bye bye. And <clears throat> so you can see that for scientists to embody this would create fairly obsessive neurotic kinds of characters. And when scientists want to remake this world in their image, we have Dr. Frankenstein and these various other scientific dystopias. The same is true of art. To take the kind of experimentation made possible here in, in the midst of media and institutions, artistic media of paint or buildings or bricks, whatever it is, space, to take this and say this is the basis of a life would create a highly disorganized, experimental, mixed up, amnesic, very peculiar life. And many people have tried to do that. If you look at what the Berlin Dadaists did, they tried to take, close the gap between art and life in, in order to take away this autonomy. But in doing so, they simply made a crazy, very eccentric region over here. And of course, if politics is life, then you're like Julius. I'll die for the nation. Now he's out on the street. He's backers to their surprise all out on the street. The street's somewhere here. And he has no idea of how to deal with the street. Poor guy, he's a political specialist. He said, I'm a child of the ANC, and indeed he is. He was born in a bubble here. And he has absolutely no idea of how to negotiate here. Nor did Stalin, nor did Hitler. Look how Hitler hit his girlfriend and strangled his niece. So what I'm saying is, even though these create extraordinary applications of reason and are critical of themselves, they are not good models for revising. And nor is a mythological or theological or belief-based system of consistency good for revising this either. This thing seems to have a very fragile and sensitive logic all of its own, but it puts these things out as experimental probes and takes them in suitably diluted, never neat. Not falsified, not prettified, but it selects from these things rather than turning these three areas, autonomous areas of reason, into norms. And Habermas puts a very interesting proposal forward at the end of his uh, paper as to how these things can interact. And I leave it to you uh, to read it and uh, see the punchline and see the conclusion. So that is one view, uh, the view of Jürgen Habermas very involved in reformulating modern critique uh, from his predecessors in the Frankfurt School after the war, very involved in the reconstruction of Germany after Hitler and the denazification. A man who knows what he talks about when he talks about democracy lapsing and how fragile it is. He's someone who grew up in that experience, born in 1929, uh, an extraordinary influential thinker, perhaps the most famous philosopher in the world today. Uh, and certainly highly respected and brilliant, comprehensive, systematic. And here is his vision of what the modern is. In other words, that's his map of where we all stand, the issues we deal with, how we got to be where we are, and what we have to parlay and negotiate. Uh, the Lebenswelt versus these systems which encroach on it, and the impossibility of making that the foundation of that, and that the foundation of that, that the foundation of that, that the foundation of that, and so forth. So I commend to you this piece, uh, Modernity Unfinished Project, and he's saying that in spite of its conservative critics who say it shouldn't have happened or say it is finished, modernity carries certain tasks which need to be picked up and fulfilled. And it's your task to extract what those tasks are and consider whether architecture doesn't have a very, very, very important role since architecture is in a way the matrix of habit and the matrix of unspoken tradition and memory whether it doesn't have a very important uh, role to fulfill there, on condition that it doesn't try and take any of these shortcuts uh, and deform itself. So I think we have about 10 minutes for questions. <clears throat> Do you have any? Please. You surely can't believe all this at face value. You must have questions. <laughs> you look pregnant with meaning. <laughs> so you're proposing that art then, or that architecture is not 
not part of art because that would make sense to me because to me architecture does work in the realms of politics and, and science as well even though not not as, as specialized as, as you're talking about well um, I'm saying that if it's not part of these three which are the three activities that, that, that we tend to regard as legitimate, objective, or at least rational, um, authoritative in some way, even if it's subjective experience, but it's still an authoritative subjective experience. Nobody denies the importance of Matisse or Paul Clay or whatever. But if it's not in these things today, the peculiarity of our modern setup is that if it's not thematized by one of these three things, then it's here. And if it's here, how does it, as something that most people regard as a profession and a specialization, how does it provide a resource and operate in here without warping this Lebenswelt, uh, uh, life world, life world, back into something that is almost pseudo-political, pseudo-scientific, pseudo whatever, because it's not actually such. To be actually such, you've got to be in here. In here, in here, that's the autonomy thesis. But this is not an autonomous realm, this is a, tradi a traditionally saturated realm. And in this country, the idea of the Lebenswelt, uh, you know, as a, as a, it's to Zusammenhang, what do you call this? Um, togetherness. It's composition, yes. Its composition is really a matter of tradition, and we, in a, in a, in a decolonizing situation, or in a situation becoming aware of the extent to which this country has been colonial, and the extent to which traditions have been seen as caricature, as something exotic, something the Zulu king does, or the reed dance, or you know, completely exoticized, and on the wrong end of the uh, um, Western perception. It's very interesting for Habermas to say that the core, the proof of the pudding, the, the, the actual substance of modern Western society is hung together by tradition. So you could imagine traditions and the way of understanding tradition and the way of using tradition which is never strongly normative, nor is it critical, could make an absolute return here. We could make the case that part of a colonial wreckage, the, the colonial terrorism, if you like, over the thoughts and the physical environment and the mental and spiritual environment of, of everyone in its path, comes from imposing these things directly upon a realm of tradition, and hence tearing apart and disqualifying that tradition, or ratcheting it up to norms like over tuning a guitar over turning a guitar string until it breaks because you're trying to ratchet it up to a normativity and in fact the western society that colonizes never lived by that normativity it's always lived in a divided world but no one's been able to make that explicit this that there is a logic of tradition a logic of common sense etc so one could have a return of tradition in highly egalitarian and pragmatic terms right here and that the differentiators that make a tradition either Western or non-Western, and we ourselves say we are not a tradition. We say we are modern, we don't have a culture. That this could be really a tool for really interrogating those things and turning a lot of the conclusions upside down, especially in this country where traditions have been disnified. But if we ourselves realize that our whole project hangs on a tradition, but it's, it's almost in our blind spot. But that we cannot no, no, more, no more jump over this than we can jump over our own shadows. And this is a site for a return of tradition. Not those tweaked up traditions of nationalism and of you know, historicized traditions and you know, romanticized traditions, but this is a very interesting realm. And it could be that architecture has got a very important part that architecture is already negotiating this realm. Um, <clears throat> providing it doesn't get too juiced up on these things. Now, I'm not saying you're better off as headless chickens, but it's important to realize there's a big chicken here that is in a very problematic relation to the heads. And I think that the uh, Habermas piece brings out this tension and kind of promises that because this is experience-based and this is experience-based, this could be the point of fluidity or the point at which this can make a foray up into this uh, realm and maybe a laboratory of different normativity or whatever, or well, this could in fact infiltrate here without too much deformation or, or anamorphosis of this thing, which we 
are really badly equipped to understand because we think in these realms and we think we're being more intelligent and critical if we supercharge each of these realms. But in fact, the basis on which these realms are accessible to us is the Lebensfeld, which is held together by tradition. So it's an interesting, very interesting, very paradoxical uh, resource. Next week, uh, we look at um, Paul Taylor, who makes the case very uh, um, openly that modernity and modernism is not the end of culture or the end of tradition, but is simply one culture and one tradition among others. I think a very important, very interesting uh, um, thesis, particularly to interrogate uh, South Africa and the whole post-colonial situation. So the Taylor piece, if you wish to do homework, the Taylor piece in the Dropbox is the relevant discussion. His attempt to construe, to create a non-individualist but communitarian framework, as it's called, um, construing modernity as a tradition, rather than as this eruption this totally new kind of phenomenon where we are scientific, we're factual, we have a secular politics, etc., but construing it as a tradition. It's also a very fabulous piece, but read the Habermas piece and hold this on board, and then read the Taylor piece in little chunks, and don't get disheartened if you don't understand it all. Because after all, it's taken 300 years to get in this mess. It's not going to take three minutes. It's like a diet, you know. You say, I've got to go on a diet after Christmas. Well, the fact is it took you six years to get so fat. So it might take you at least one, you know, to lose it. So it's taken 300 years to get into these kinds of dilemmas. We cannot authentically be where we are by ignoring them, but they are not uh, part of your intuition, as you can see. So we need to tease them open and make them available to you, etc., and see how this can make a more powerful generation of architects uh, operating in a phenomenal laboratory for all these matters. This country is the greatest laboratory for all of these things anywhere in the world. You know? That's why I'm not sitting in Stanford somewhere. Uh, so here we have it. Um, is the Habermas model completely secular? Or is there or any religious experience subject to the religion as well? Well, you know, the, the religious experience, there's, there's a kind of genealogy to be written about this aesthetic realm. And it's per and the way it makes experience permeable and, and makes the boundaries of the individual, the rational individual, the political individual, the citizen, permeable. You know, that suggests that, that this, in a way, is a receptacle of a lot of religious experience. Because a lot of religious experience, uh, or a lot of religions aim at the transformation of experience, the transformation of the self, the transfiguration of experience, so on. So, so in that case, Habermas' own position on religion is interesting because he had a very interesting and very sympathetic debate with Ratzenberger, who is now the Pope, but before he was the Pope. Um, <clears throat> and Habermas' position on religion is very interesting. There are, there are a couple of things that are all online. Just say Habermas, religion, Google, etc. Where you see how he, how he takes a very interesting view of religion as a resource, but on the other hand, let's not forget that this whole configuration as a modern opposition to something as a break with the past was essentially a break with religious religious Europe. So it's an interesting tension. Um, absolutely nobody today could dismiss religion the way one would in the 18th century or whatever, the whole Enlightenment uh, kind of view. But if it makes its return, it makes its return in and amongst these things, either genealogically as part of the conditions for this kind of thinking could well be religious. And in the Taylor, those of you who are interested, there's a fantastic book by uh, Taylor called The Sources of the Self, where he looks at the transitions that creates what he calls the modern buffered self. A uh, fantastic um, book online uh, that we can maybe upload for those of you who are interested. And Taylor himself is a staunch Catholic. As are many interesting thinkers, Bruno Latour, Taylor, Mary Douglas, uh, Marshall McLuhan, um, big list, many people. So <clears throat> it's an interesting open uh, type of question. It's a good one to raise. I don't think it's quite appropriate to talk of religion in the aesthetic, but nor is it a species of politic, nor is it a science. So it's, it's, it's in a way it shares the homelessness of the Lebensfeld. Any other questions? I'm just curious, um, how does this relate 
relate to the Tua's concept of the hybrid. Um, I don't know about Tua, obviously, those categories don't really exist at all. <laughs> Well, you, you're jumping ahead to one of the ways out, you know. Uh, Latour says that these things are held in their kind of freeze frame by critique and by a very simple ontology in the West. By ontology, we've simpl simplified what we can imagine, the kinds of things that exist between subject and nature. We've got a very brutal, simple ontology. And he wants to create the hybrid is to create a higher degree of complexity in ontology and bring the object back in all of its dimensions. So in Latour, you have a, a, a way of really dissolving this as a myth. Quite close to Taylor, who says that this is in fact the expression of a culture. Now what kind of culture operates this way and needs these tools to operate and so on. So next time we meet uh, Taylor, uh, so that will give us our two pictures of modernity. And then we press on, and we will end with the absolutely craziest of all, which is Schlotterdijk, who's like a really hot guy. You know, you could either do Zizek or Schlotterdijk because they're two controversial big mouths, but Schlotterdijk is like a hundred times more intelligent than Zizek. And he just drinks, he's not putting powder in his nose. And he's quite tall, and I always think that makes him a more trustworthy person for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Schlotterdijk has some phenomenal tools for architecture, but where Schlotterdijk fits into this picture, it really requires a mastery of all the an antecedent debates. You know, if you don't know this, you'll say, well, ah, that's just merely odd. But he's moving like a chess game uh, with his notion of sphären and, and this intriguing idea of cynical reason. So anyway, that's what we'll get to. Uh, we'll have many twists and turns in between. Please don't be shy to ask questions. If something's really bothering you, then please uh, do feel free to send me an email. Um, but read. Read the tailor and read the Habermas, please. Good. Thank you very much for your time and your attention.